Hi, I'm Sandra Hutchins. I'm the Sheriff Coroner of Orange County, and you're watching Facets Television. Hello, my name is Judge Jim Gray. I'm retired from the Orange County Superior Court, and you are watching Facets Television. I'm Kevin McDonald, and you're watching a new segment called OC's Most Wanted. And I want to give you a little background on where we came from and why we're here. My executive producer, David McNeil, and myself and the crew here for the last several years have been doing segments, programs, interviews, and so on about crime prevention, human trafficking and recovery prevention, education, talking with folks from law enforcement, members of the community, crime prevention professionals. And the bottom line is we thought, you know what, it's time to get out and get aggressive. We know there's America's Most Wanted. We know there are these other programs that are nationally based, but you know what, they don't focus on that case that's important enough for the local community and law enforcement to care, to want to get an answer, whether it's a missing person, a person of interest, somebody who's killed somebody and run, whatever it might be, the bottom line, it's important to us and our community. So we decided, you know what, we're going to take the power of this studio and our cameras at Facets TV and we're going to create OC's Most Wanted for you. We hope that you'll participate with us. We hope that you will be there for us when we ask for your help. I'm Kevin McDonald and I hope you'll watch OC's Most Wanted. I'm Kevin McDonald, and I am the host of Fast Television, but today we're here to talk about a new segment called OC's Most Wanted. With us today is going to be Lieutenant Jeff Halleck, who's with the Orange County Sheriff's Department as their public information officer. Thank you so much for coming in tonight. No problem. I appreciate it very much. Um, so as you know, we started this new program called OC's Most Wanted, and you and I had a conversation about a couple of the active cases that the department does, but briefly, I'd like to know... Um, what is the general process when you get uh, the decision to make it a most wanted or a top level case for the department? Well, it, it's a case by case basis, obviously, and so a lot of it tends to um, go along with the investigation. We obviously defer to investigators to do as much follow up investigation as they can on a particular case, and many times when they run out of leads or run out of you know different things to follow up on then it's necessary to kind of make it more of a, a public event and put it out to the media and in, in the attempt to, to gain information or, or something from the media that would help push the, the case forward. So in that case then basically what's what's happening is they go through their normal process if they hit a wall and they believe it's a, a high enough profile case they hand it off and then it starts to be a, an outreach program right? That's correct I mean there's there's cases where they've got enough information to work right off the bat that they can move forward and hopefully make an arrest or, or do what they need to do. But at some point, like you said, they'll hit a wall or we feel that the, the public or the media can provide us an opportunity to gather some, some much needed information to solve a case. So I can tell you as a person who lives in Orange County, it's really um, great to hear the fact that there aren't that many cases that are being left outstanding to the degree that you need the public's help. So. But I do know there's a couple of cases. We spoke briefly about the Eric Alonzo case. So if you could tell me a little bit about Erica's case, how did it start, where has it gone, and, and what are you looking for in the way of a result from the public? Well, the status of the case today is that she is still missing, still being handled uh, by our homicide investigative unit, but as a missing person case. At this point, we don't have any information to lead us to believe that a crime has, in fact, been committed. We did, a couple of weeks ago, locate her vehicle that had been missing for about five to six weeks. Mm -hmm. And at this point, we're still moving forward trying to locate Ms. Alonzo. She went missing early morning of February 15th. It was a night, Valentine's night, that she spent with her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. She was last seen that next morning at between 4 and 5 o'clock in the morning. She left his residence in the city of Irvine. And unfortunately, that's the last anybody has seen or heard from her. Um, we know that since then there's been no, um, no activity on her financial accounts or social media accounts, no cell phone activity, so 
obviously investigators and obviously her family are very concerned and so we're just moving forward with trying to gather as much information as we can. And that generally doesn't bode well. Was she considered to be mentally stable? Is there any reason to think that she would just wander off? I mean, or We don't have any information or evidence to indicate that she would have any motivation to, to wander off. Mm -hmm. and, um, just based on the fact that you know she was described by her friends and her family as a social media butterfly and for her not to be present on social media to them was very very concerning and obviously that is to investigators also no kidding um, so at this point what is uh, wh where can people find information on her we'll be posting information in posters but in general if someone wants to figure out or track a case like this where do they find information besides the likes of Orange County Crime Stoppers or someone like that? Well, all of our cases with the Orange County Sheriff's Department, we post all of our media releases or anything relative to the public on our website at mm -hmm. ocsd.org. Uh, if we were to update that case with some additional information, we obviously put out a media release as soon as we went public with the case, and then we followed that up with updated information when we located her vehicle. So if people want to go to our, our blog on OCSD.org, they can find the most up-to-date information. So let's circle back a little bit for those that may be following or have followed the case like I had. Um, there was a couple at a nightclub that seemed to be a, a point of interest at one point, but they've been cleared. Can you tell me a little bit about that? That's correct. The information that we received was that Erica and her boyfriend were out the evening of February 14th at a nightclub in the city of Costa Mesa. Mm -hmm. We we gained some surveillance video of another couple that was hanging out with Ms. Alonzo and her boyfriend and unfortunately her boyfriend didn't even know who the, these people were. They met them, they went back to Ms. Alonzo's boyfriend's house, they hang out for a couple hours, but he really didn't know who they were other mm -hmm. than having met them at the nightclub. So we put that information out to the media and with the assistance of the media in getting those photos out, the couple, both the male and the female, actually called the Sheriff's Department late that night and we were able to talk to them, but unfortunately they, they didn't really provide us any additional clues. They really just corroborated information that investigators already knew. Right, so we pretty much knew that, that there doesn't seem to be any reason at this point to believe they were involved. They just happened to be with them that evening. That is correct. I believe investigators do believe that they didn't have anything to do with the disappearance of Ms. Alonzo. Got it. Um, so if someone has a tip, um, what do you suggest is the best way to provide information to the department at this point? The easiest way is just to call our general number, and that's area code 714-647-7000. Mm -hmm. You can provide that information to our department commander on duty 24 hours a day, and based on the information that the person has, he can, we can direct that tip or that information to the appropriate investigative unit. Perfect. Okay. So let's move, move to another case that I'm uh, slightly familiar with, which is the burrito case. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Let's start from the beginning because I know that the folks watching don't have any background on it. Um, this has to do with the vehicular manslaughter of a child? That's correct. So can you go from the beginning and tell me where we are now? Yeah, this case began last year, March of 2014. It was actually it was in the city of San Juan Capistrano the evening following the Swallows Day Parade. Mm -hmm. uh, late that evening, Mr. Burrito Soto is accused of driving his vehicle. He was driving westbound on Junipero Cerro Road. He crossed over Camino Capistrano and into an adjacent parking lot. Mm -hmm. uh, we've released video of that collision, but you can see Mr. Burrito Soto as he gets into the parking lot. He accelerates pretty high rate of speed and eventually goes over an embankment mm -hmm. and collides with some large rocks on the side of the embankment. As a result of that collision, he had four of his children in the vehicle, but as a result of the collision, three of his children were injured pretty significantly, mm -hmm. and his five-year-old daughter uh, succumbed and died as a result of her yeah, injuries. Tragic. So based on that, the preliminary investigation was believed that Mr. Brito Soto was driving under the influence of alcohol. He was arrested that evening. He was booked into jail. He was arraigned several days later. Uh, the district attorney's office filed vehicular manslaughter charges as well as some child abuse charges because the children that were in the in the car, all four of them, were not right. restrained properly. And no. so, so unfortunately, it's injury and child endangerment. Absolutely, and, and investigators feel very strongly that the lack of restraint contributed to their significant injuries and to the death of the five-year-old daughter. But right. at any rate, he was arraigned uh, several weeks later. He posted a hundred thousand dollar bond. Uh, he was released from jail on that bond and has not been seen or heard from since. He has not showed up to any of the subsequent court dates. And so the case has been filed by the Orange County District Attorney's Office, but investigators, you know, beca because of the seriousness of this crime, we're really putting a lot of effort into attempting to locate Mr. Brito Soto and bring him to justice. And as our media releases have had said so far, we believe he does have ties locally to the city of San Juan Capistrano, but we also know he has ties to 
the state of Texas, the Chicago area, and even uh, down into Mexico. So he does have an international ties, and it is possible that he's crossed the border and gone down there. Could you, do we believe he could be comfortable at that point? I mean, that's not easy for an American to do, but if someone has prior ties. That is correct. And, you know, we've exhausted the resources that we have down in Mexico and then in the state of Texas and in Illinois and the Chicago area. We've exhausted resources we have in those areas in an mm -hmm. attempt to locate Mr. Brito Soto. But we've been unsuccessful so far, and so that's why we want to put that information out to the public. Well, I really appreciate your coming in this, this evening and talking with us, and I, I do want to say that I, I look forward to working with you in the department to see that as we get these cases um, that we can move them forward more quickly if possible and spread them into zones that may not be seen unless they're watching our program. So I really want to thank you for your thank time you, and all you do for, for the community. Uh, with us has been Lieutenant Jeff Halleck, with the Orange County Sheriff's Department. He is the public information officer, and we really appreciate him coming in. You are now watching the Orange County's Most Wanted News segment on Facets Television, and we hope you'll watch again soon. I'm Mark Babbitt, CEO and founder of U-Turn, and you are watching Eye on Business. Welcome to Ion Business Innovation, where we look at innovative companies, innovative products, and innovative people. Today we have the pleasure of Dr. Deb Ferber. Deb, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, um, I'm excited about talking with you because you and I have a bunch in common. We both teach entrepreneurship, and I wanted to hear your views on entrepreneurship. And uh, But before we do that, Tell me how you got into this line of work. Oh my goodness, I've been a serial entrepreneur for years. Okay. So no matter what I do or any type of career I've been involved in, I'm always involved in some type of entrepreneurial activity. But everything from selling paper to yachts <laughs> to <laughs> software, okay. um, and uh, now it's real estate investment trusts. So. Okay. But how did all that start? I mean, when you were a kid, did you want to be an entrepreneur when you grew up, or you what know, was the story? My father was an entrepreneur, okay, okay. so we always worked for a Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 company, but always had a company on the side. So I think ah, I just okay. kind of lived eat, and, and you know was breathing that kind of environment. So. Gotcha. So, Deborah, um, one of the questions that's come from our audience is uh, is about failure. Um, so there's a lot of points along the way, as you know, where where a company or a startup can fail. Um, what can we, should we be doing about that? I think we need to stress that uh, failure is a, a natural occurrence. Okay. And uh, it's uh, part of that, that life stage, and you have to be a good uh, baseball player and keep swinging. And eventually you're going to make a connection. And what we can do is uh, make it uh, more likely that you're going to connect a lot faster. Well, it's funny, because what I was taught, I was actually brought up as a scientist more than an entrepreneur. And what was euphemistically called the scientific method um, by other terms is called trial and error, right. which by definition means most of your trials end up in some kind of error. And eventually somewhere in there, something does prove out that you go forward with, but, but the, the, rate, the error rate, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. is pretty high. Yes. And so I, I think it almost requires a certain type of person, but maybe it requires a certain type of training. What do you think? Two things. I, I always tell people when you're looking for funding, they're going to tell you you need to make sure you're only focused on this business. And if you can, try and have a, a night job and a day job <laughs> to keep things going if you can. Yeah. Uh, when, it, when it's time to get funding, you can't do that, but to always have uh, safety. And uh, that was why I went back for my doctorate, too. I could okay. start businesses and things and, and still have a backup plan. And, but that's very important. Backup plans are important. Well, it's funny because every time I hear an entrepreneur's story, and I just heard one uh, yesterday, that uh, was very dramatic. It was actually ultimately a success story. But when I hear of all the failures along the way and the ups and downs, um, I mean, how did this guy know to stay with it? Um, there seems to be something different about the true serial entrepreneur, that they, yes. 
Uh, don't take no for an answer. Don't take failure as a sign to stop. Right. Uh, they find a different way to either pivot, go forward, or whatever. But what can you and I and others be doing to help prepare people for that journey? I think tenacity is very important, but again, what we're doing at the center is so wonderful because we're giving them tools that for years I didn't have access to. I had the educational background, but not the access and the contacts. So if you have one business that fails, you may have uh, gotten a list of contacts for the next one. And uh, it's not that odd to see people who fail that can still get funding for the next one after that as well. So what I was taught, uh, right, wrong, or indifferent, was if I ran into a problem and I didn't know the answer, was to reach out to a resource. And, uh, and the phrase was, you know, use your resources. And if you didn't have that resource, go find a new resource. Um, and so I never felt like I was stuck, stuck in the sense of this is the final, this is the end. Yes. It was like it was just a question of could I find the right resource to help me through this. And a lot of times I didn't like the answer I got. Um, and I ended up going to another resource or you know, having to learn something new that I wasn't prepared for. But is it just a game of finding the right resource or is it more complicated than that? Again, the strategy of, of really targeting the right market, just because you build it doesn't mean they're going to come. And I always tell that to young entrepreneurs. It's, it's a wonderful idea, but you know, who's going to really buy it or, yeah. or use it as a service? I think that's so important that you know, when you start that way, I think it's a better way to go. But um, again, to be able to be dusted off. I parachute jump on weekends, and <laughs> I sometimes miss my mark, and I dust myself off, and back I go. And eventually, I hit my mark. And that's the way entrepreneurs really need to, you know, lead their lives. You started taking a different tack on the old, what color is my parachute? That's right. <laughs> the fact that you actually use a parachute is, I guess, a good thing. But, well, what we just heard from Steve Blank about, you know, what we're really doing is hypothesis testing. And by definition, that means some of those won't pan out. But it's different than, you know, drive towards a, a single path to success. It says, you know, we've got we've to ask lots of questions along the way. And when we don't get the answers we expect, um, then it probably means some kind of pivot is in order, some kind of yes. change in either strategy or uh, behavior or whatever. So um, what can we do to sort of prepare people for that rate of change that they have to experience? Well, the great news is the millennial group is really ready for change. Okay. <laughs> okay. So they've got agility that my generation never had. Yeah. So they're definitely rigid is not, in, you know, part of their description. So I think that generation has um, much more opportunity because they're so connected to social networks and I think, um, again, because they're agile, it's going to give them a really leg up. Good, good. So is there anything else we could be telling people, anything else we should be preparing them for as far as the, the high rate of failure? I mean, it's just... Uh... Again, uh, the family unit. I always tell people, okay. be prepared <laughs> if you have a spouse or you've got family. That yeah. family has to make that commitment as well. Yeah. And sometimes I, I find very successful entrepreneurs, yeah. if they don't let their spouse know what they're up to, okay. um, it could really <laughs> put, you know, put a gabosh on, on you know, their, their home life. So that's so very important, I too. I was very fortunate. My teammate and business partner was also my spouse. And so she not only understood, she was leading the way at least half the time. So. And an extension of that is what people now refer to as the complementary team, that if you have people different than yourself, cover different functions, different areas of expertise, that you've got a higher probability of either preventing failure or surviving failure because you've got a more resourceful team. Yes. Uh, do you find that is what works for the entrepreneurs you see? Or? Absolutely. Diversity is the way because diversity really is, is uh, an indicator of what your market looks like. So your customer most likely will be diverse. Okay. And so again, uh, different input from different cultures, ethnicities, very important. So what we discovered almost by accident was um, that this, an extension of this, go find a better resource or go find another resource, was we would add somebody to the team. It's like we were short in this area, we, we needed a CIO, we went and got a CO. We were short in the financial area, we went and got a CFO. And, but it was always a sense of, okay, where are we failing? Where are we most vulnerable? And mm -hmm. then going and trying to fill that gap. Somebody said it the other day that tries to take his biggest problem and turn it into his biggest advantage. And uh, I, th I wish I'd have heard that advice that clearly right, 40 right. years ago. Yes. But that's almost accidentally what we did, was we'd see a gap and say, okay, how are we going to fix that? And we go get another resource. Oftentimes that resource initially was a subcontractor or a part-time thing, but if we liked that person, we worked well together, we'd bring him into the inner circle, and suddenly what was a weakness became a strength. Um, so the term that I heard back in the day was muscle building. How do you muscle build your organization? How do you build up the areas that are weak and make them stronger? Um, what can we be building into our entrepreneurship curricula that uh, sort of better prepare people to do this? 
Well, when we're building our teams, I was just thinking right off the bat, stock options, because that okay. seems to be coming okay. up, too. Okay. And the uh, students the other evening were asking about stock options when they start their company, and that seems to be a big trend right now with funding organizations. They want to make sure those first five key in individuals in the company yeah. Yeah. are really, um, truly vested okay. in the company. So um, I think offering stock options, uh, ESOPs, things that would be an incentive for someone to work those 80, 90 hours a week, <laughs> even though they may not be the primary owner, but what will be that incentive to really have people, you know, really own it? So that brings up the obvious tough thing, that if I'm an entrepreneur, uh, if I'm going to do that, it means I'm giving up. You know, I've yes. got this brilliant idea, and it's all mine And when I start. And then all of a sudden, I'm going to bring you in or two or three other people. Uh, it means I'm giving up some part of the ownership. How right. do we handle that? As long as it stays under 20%. <laughs> okay. So, I, and the only reason I, I just recently saw a preview, and 20% uh, was given away. And once the VCs come in, uh, th then you know, basically you've lost the control of the company. So again, um, evaluation of the organization is going to be important. We'll be able to teach our students how to do a great evaluation, so the number of shares. And uh, you can always look at the percentile based on number of employees, but okay. keep it under 20. Okay. Well, I, I've always been the proponent that you've got to, if you're going to build this complementary team, it's got to get beyond you. The, the biggest frustration my students have with me is I'm always encouraging them to work in a team. I say, but I want to work on my idea. And my counter is always, until your idea becomes our idea, their idea, everybody's idea, then yes. uh, you've got an army of one and you're going to lose. Uh, but if you can build that stronger team, you're going to have to give up something, you're going to have to share something. But the old adage is, you know, um, what is it, 10% of something is better than 100% of nothing? So. Absolutely, absolutely. And if people are willing to give a pint of blood each week, you want to be able to give something back. So, But collaboration is so important. And again, you're only as good as your team. So. Now, um, my understanding, and it's, it's not that deep, is that business uh, schools have always offered things on marketing and finance. What's different about what you teach to entrepreneurs? I would say it's more of a guerrilla marketing uh, type okay. of uh, okay. launch. So again, the budget dollars are very minimal. And so how can we really uh, capitalize on small budgets and really launch something? And uh, with social media now, so those are things that um, perhaps the standard marketing classes don't offer, okay. where the entrepreneurship you know, program really does stress that. So I know you are uh, well liked by the students. What is it they like about what you do that's, that gets them all buzzed up here? So, Gosh, I'd, I'd like to believe it's because I'm available after hours. <laughs> okay. I look at business plans. I think it's passion. I, I think okay. students have uh, described me as someone who's very passionate about what, what she does. Okay. So I've always been passionate about uh, certain businesses and teaching, and so I, I hope it's contagious. Okay. So. So, that's what they like about you. What do you like about them? Oh, my goodness. They're the next generation, the great okay. hope. It's the way to grow the economy. So okay. it's the great catalyst. And I think um, without them, you know, our economy will, will really you know, falter. So it's going to be the next generation. Okay. So we're doing some things right. But um, what could we be doing different uh, to help prepare entrepreneurs better than we already do? I would say the business plan. So okay. um, everything from the pitch to the business plan, where I'm now dealing with Tech Coast Angels, and those pitches have really changed from 14 <laughs> years ago when I was yeah. pitching. So from 22 slides, it can be between 6 and 10. Yeah, yeah. So there's a whole different venue out there. So we can keep them really on top of what the new venues are. And, and we're very involved with Tech Coast Angels and, and VCs. Okay. So we're on top of that. So I, I just came back from the uh, Angel Capital Association, and they were talking a lot about the, the formulas that work. And one of the things that seems to come through, whether it's uh, university programs or accelerators is combining mentors with uh, the students or the entrepreneurs. Um, do you have any particular um, you know, perspective on that about what we ought to be doing or not doing there? Well, based on what I've seen in your center, it's wonderful because you've got these wonderful mentors, which I never had. So my mentor was my father, okay. <laughs> and, um, and some of these students didn't have you know, a parent role model to do that. So imagine you're getting a seasoned entrepreneur to work with somebody like that. It's, it's fantastic. Okay. Now, how do we, what's the best way to do the matching? So we've got, you know, people that need to learn, people that want to do the teaching, but uh, what's the best way to match them up, do you think? That's a great question. I would say, again, we'd have to take a look at the industries. Okay. Um, and again, we have so many entrepreneurs that, um, especially in the, in the Tech Coast Angel area, okay, yeah. where they're, they're people of leisure, and they love <laughs> to give back. So it's our one percentile that wants to give back, and so we want to take advantage of that. So they're, they're so willing to help. I think it's a great thing. I was just going to ask you about crowdfunding. It was a big topic at this conference, um, and there's lots of different forms of crowdfunding now. Yes. Um, how do you think that will change the landscape? 
interesting. A few months ago, I went to an event, and I was listening to a crowdfunding group, and I wasn't quite sure what to think of it, and yeah. they raised about $10,000 within a 45-minute period of time while they were lecturing you know, on the topic. <laughs> I was quite impressed at that point. Um, so I think there's a really great venue for that, as well as testing the market. What a great yeah, way yeah, to do it. Yeah. But you know something I, I find a little frightening, though, is I tell people if they do go that route, yeah. they have to make it successful because the venture capitalist or the Tech Coast Angels will ask you if you've done crowdfunding and what kind of capital you were able to garner. So it's, it's a tricky deal. Um, I mean, obviously, the democratization that we all talk about is, is a good thing. You know, a lot more people can get into the game. But once you're in it, people are watching and keeping score. So, Absolutely. Um, is there any advice you have for people about how to manage that uh, lovely opportunity of more democracy? Yes. I, again, if you're going to launch that campaign, you have to assume that that's going to be the, the path to getting more funding. So it has to be successful. So it can't be done um, half-heartedly. It really has to be a campaign. So that's something we can work on with our students as well so to do those like campaigns. I'm sorry, it sounds like more rehearsal then and more preparation, probably? Absolutely, and follow through because you are okay. managing okay. Uh, contacts and, and uh, feedback from potential Now, the, the term that angels and others use is uh, how coachable is the, uh, is the entrepreneur. Um, is there such a thing as being too coachable, too uncoachable? I mean, what, how would you bracket it? You know, as an entrepreneur, you have a, a great vision. So yeah. are you allowing other people to interject in your vision? If you are not, uh, perhaps an angel investor will be very leery. Okay. And um, again, it's good to always listen. You may uh, opt not to implement. Okay. But again, I think the great listener uh, can take that information and use it you know, the best way possible. But if you're not a good listener, I think we're in trouble. So uh, let me know how you react to this. I sometimes worry about the entrepreneur that takes in too much feedback, and particularly mm -hmm. when they're getting feedback from six different directions or something. Yes. Um, is that a problem? Is that? Uh, I think that's where we come in, okay. especially the center where we can say now you're listening to someone who specializes in the finance side, now the marketing side, and maybe we can really help kind of redirect. But um, I think more information is not bad, but you're right. How do we filter it out? I think that's going to be something we're going to work on, I hope. So I've asked you a lot of questions, but uh, is there something I haven't asked you that you'd like to tell our audience about either your background or where you think entrepreneurs ought to go? Or Oh, my goodness. Well, I... I know that women are opening more businesses okay. than, than any other segment out there, and, and um, I just hope we have a lot more women going into uh, businesses for themselves. It creates economic parity, and I'm happy to say that Chapman's really doing that, thanks to you. Well, I couldn't agree more, so I hope more, more women like you get involved in the business. That'd be terrific. So.